can still hear me fine. Um, uh, good morning and uh, welcome uh, to the latest uh, emissions analytics webinar. Uh, this time on the topic of uh, tyre wear, chemical composition and toxicity. My name is Nick Molden. I'm the Chief Executive of Emissions Analytics and uh, very grateful uh, for your joining today and spending time um, with us on this topic. So the format of it is going to be a maximum of one hour in total. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes, uh, set out our, our latest research and findings, and then leave up to half an hour for questions, um, which you can submit via the uh, chat facility uh, on the, this software. I will then uh, read out uh, the questions and, and answer them. Um, so, and I would suggest by all means submit questions as we go along, um, but I, I will tackle all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so on that note, um, uh, let's get started. So uh, first of all, um, a little bit about us. Um, so I, I think this, with these topics, um, it's very important not to just get uh, tunnel visions with how we've thought about air quality and how we've regulated things uh, in the past. I mean, what motivates us is about finding out what are the current latest problems uh, in the world of air quality and environmental uh, pollution more generally, and attacking the problem with an honest desire to understand what the real problem is and, and to do it with as much transparency and clarity as, as possible. But that we believe is the best route to delivering uh, environmental problems and bringing all the stakeholders together to come to solutions. And that really govern, governs uh, everything we do. Uh, and particularly important in this area, which is essentially a new and emerging area of potential environmental concern. Um, emissions analytics, we are now uh, over 10 years old, um, headquartered in the UK, but we operate many locations uh, around the world, North America and Asia as well. Uh, and we started out with um, tailpipe emissions uh, and uh, we developed methodologies um, at, that, at that time, long before the real driving emissions, real world uh, on-road testing. We developed our own real world testing uh, methodologies, which we've now applied to over 2,500 vehicles of all shapes and sizes passenger car, commercial off-road. But now we've expanded this using exactly the same philosophy and principles and now looking at vehicle interior air quality. So what pollution gets inside vehicles, but, and the subject of today, tires. Tires and to understand what role, if any, um, they play in uh, environmental pollution and what to do about it. Uh, now, we're a commercial company and um, make no uh, secret of that. Uh, and so a key part of our business model is that we go out and test lots of things, put the information in databases, which are then available for anyone to subscribe to. So th this data, we try and get it into as many people's hands uh, as we can uh, and uh, uh, fund, you know, funded by the subscriptions to the database. And to that end, we work with people up and down the supply chain from regulators, OEMs, down to fleets and practitioners on the ground. Personally, um, also, I mean, I'm very committed to, um, you know, while we're developing methods and data internally, is to try and propagate that and communicate that as much as possible externally. And, and to that end, I'm personally chairman of two uh, SEN work, standardization workshop in Europe, um, workshop number 90, which standardized urban NOx emissions from the tailpipe. Uh, and now, and more recently, on standardising uh, vehicle interior air quality. That's workshop 103, which is coming shortly to its conclusion and hopefully we'll be publishing a very useful standard uh, for, for pushing forward knowledge. And I'm also an honorary research fellow at Imperial uh, College London, um, which is really important in terms of uh, uh, developing academic um, papers, peer review and, and the like. Um, so that's us in background. So today, so what I wanted to cover is really the whole horizon uh, of how we see tyre wear emissions and what we've done so far uh, by way of research and where we're going next. So first I wanted to set out what the, the tyre wear problem uh, is, um, or, but then looking at questions of chemical composition, of wear rates, 
but also then moving forward to toxicity uh, and uh, and then what are the potential environmental effects of tyres and then also putting it into a, a wider context to, you know, just to stand back and say, you know, is this a big problem or, or, or not? And, you know, a, a fairly minor one we don't need to lose too much sleep about. So the problem. Uh, so in very round numbers, uh, given the millions and millions of vehicles on the roads of, uh, if we take US and Europe added together, uh, the amount of tyre material that is shed from light duty vehicles um, is over 300,000 tonnes every year. Uh, and I call that tyre rubber um, because most of the tyres of light duty vehicles is not natural rubber, it's synthetic rubber and all sorts of other components. But in terms of the total mass of material that's shed into the environment is uh, over 300,000 tonnes. And you know, without going one step further, in terms of research. That is a big enough number um, to at least raise an eyebrow. I think you know, that is a lot of material um, of a composition we perhaps don't fully understand. And so that is a potential environmental effect we need to research further. Um, then the next point is, well, actually, we believe that th that amount is increasing over time. More vehicles on the road, more miles being driven, heavier vehicles, a number of different factors leading to that likely increasing and, and if you extend outside US and Europe uh, increasing very rapidly. Um, and uh, uh, while at the same time tailpipe emissions seem to be falling uh, or are well, indeed are falling. So in terms of relative importance uh, the uh, tyres is, is increasing and tyres have a complex and opaque chemistry. They say we don't know what's in them um, and we don't know how they propagate into the environment, and we don't really know uh, what the health effects are yet. So there's a lot of unknowns made worse by the fact that there's no real, real world standard methods, uh, not widely employed, that can easily um, you know, shine light on this. So there's a lot of work to do just to start establishing test methods and then, um, then starting to understand these questions. So there's independent uh, insight and clarity is, is urgently needed and that's where we feel we come into this. What are the, the sources of emissions from vehicles? Um, so obviously the classic one is the tailpipe uh, and uh, the, which is extremely low now on new cars. Uh, I think it's easy to underestimate quite how rapidly um, particles but other emissions from tailpipe have fallen. So when it comes to tailpipe emissions, in, my, in our opinion, it is not so much about ever tighter regulations, it's more about getting the older, dirtier vehicles off the road as quickly as possible and replacing them with the newer, and I'm, not, and I'm talking internal combustion engines, even if there's not a single extra battery vehicle sold, we convert, you know, ab dramatically reduce tailpipe emissions by turning over the fleet. Brake wear, which is possibly of the non-exhaust emissions, may be the greatest at the moment, um, and so it's significant. But as more and more vehicles have uh, regenerative braking, uh, this is likely to decline. And it's not just battery electric vehicles and hybrids that have regenerative braking that is uh, appearing on more and more what are seemingly internal combustion engine vehicles, but are mild hybrid vehicles, which are able to recoup great energy and, and therefore take strain off the brakes using engine braking. Um, road wear is a lower component of it but is growing as vehicles get heavier and road wear, particularly asphalt, is likely to contain many toxic components but again not very well understood yet. Resuspension, which is all the material from a variety of sources which gets whipped up as vehicles, which is already there but gets whipped up as vehicles pass, um, is significant, absolutely, but often because a lot of it is dust and mud and other things from fields, um, and so not just all from vehicles, is on average probably less toxic. So that leaves tyres, which is significant, may be similar uh, in aggregate to brakes uh, in terms of total mass, but it is growing uh, and it is potentially uh, toxic in composition, and which is what we will look at today. So, and then what are the levers that can be done about this to, to affect this? Because this is only really 
an interesting area of research if there's then something we can do about it. So how can we affect tyre wear emissions? Um, well, one very simple uh, way of doing it is to drive more slowly. Um, and that's in terms of the ease of execution, you know, that could, that could be done very, very easily. Um, you know, speed limits, you know, uh, as with the sort of 70s energy crisis, and that is a way of reducing fuel consumption. But actually, that is, while that does have a positive effect, it actually, in a per mile distance specific sense, doesn't actually affect tyre emissions that much. Changing the model of tyre um, is a, uh, an obvious thing to do uh, and would have a high impact potentially, but that's where we have the need for new information to understand which tyres are the most or least toxic and that will be the subject of a lot of today. Um, the other initiatives will actually, aggressive driving, cornering, accelerating, does have a big effect, a large effect on tyre wear emissions. But as with a lot of these behavioural things, uh, getting people to actually do it is, is the hard bit. So big potential positive effect, but quite hard to deliver. Reducing vehicle weight, that again could have a very high effect, uh, although it's being offset by regenerative braking. But that can only be put into effect when you change your car. And unfortunately, the trend is towards ever heavier cars, not lighter cars. So we're going in the wrong direction on that. Improving road surface is definitely a way uh, and you know, the shorter term way of doing it is to get rid of potholes and other defects on the carriageway. Changing uh, the uh, road surface itself is obviously more expensive and more difficult um, uh, long, you know, on a more uh, bigger scale. And then avoiding problematic weather conditions that can um, uh, negatively affect uh, either the physical makeup of the tyre or the performance of the tyre. Um, Yes, weather does have a big effect, but actually given that journeys are not really dictated by the weather, but it's actually the ability to deliver actual tyre wear reduction is unpredictable. So they're really the high level factors um, and, and context. So the concept we're, we're putting forward today is then um, the environmental impact uh, of, uh, the, uh, of tyres is, is some function of the chemical speciation, so I, what the tyre is made up of chemically, the wear rate, so at what rate is the material released into the environment, and for each of those compounds released, how toxic are they? But it may, it may be that tyres release a massive amount of the material into the environment, but it's not very toxic, and so we don't need to worry about it too much. But the, those, are the, those are the three factors um, to, to look at. So first of all, let's take the chemical side. Now, to do this, we've opened a lab based around two-dimensional gas chromatography and mass spectrometry um, to profile the organic compounds in tyres. Um, and we key to this is the second dimension. Uh, gas chromatography is a very common technique, um, but the problem with tyres is a lot of those are higher order carbon compounds which cannot be separated from each other using single dimension gas chromatography. So the second dimension is necessary by using a second column, uh, a second separation dimension of time, we're able to resolve that complex mixture of higher order hydrocarbon of, of, of carbon compounds. Uh, and uh, Sepsolve Analytical, UK company, developed a, a modulator uh, to be able to um, use it to apply that second dimension to samples. And then we uh, use a, a time of flight mass spectrometer to be able to identify the compounds. So the chromatography does the separation, the spectrometer does the identification, and we use an optic for to get the sample into the system in the first place. And more details of, of this is available on our website. Um, so that's the kit. Uh, the, then we uh, developed the method, and this was not a trivial un undertaking. And what we were trying to get to was a short space of time to be able to simulate um, uh, or uh, what of these organic chemicals would leach into the environment over time. So the tyre material sheds off the car wherever it goes in the environment and then gradually over time the organic compounds leach out. Um, and so we wanted to be able to simulate that in a short lab test. And uh, in such a way as the results were repeatable enough to allow fair comparison uh, between different tyres. 
Um, so repeatability and but real worldness about it were crucial. And then, as we do, uh, then to apply that method to a large number of tyres, so we then present databases uh, that allow uh, comparison. Um, we worked with the National Physical Laboratory, uh, the metrology lab in the UK, there to look specifically at the question of what are the uncertainties involved in these measurements. Uh, and I'll come on to that in the, in the next slide. Um, we also uh, subjected our initial results to peer review by a number of domain experts. Um, and the first thing that we published as such with this, apart from our webinars and the like, is we submitted to a, a European consultation on tire wear, which was published recently. Um, so although uh, you know, there's no academic papers as yet, we have gone through the, the process of a lot of external scrutiny as to what we're doing. And one of those, and, and this is not to go into huge detail, but this is the nature of the uncertainty analysis performed by MPL, looking at, looking at all the different um, sources of uncertainty in the measurements. Now, I mean, and the 95% confidence interval is a 47% um, error rate, which actually, interestingly, is very similar to what the, uh, the error rate was on tailpipe NOx emissions when it was first uh, included in real world driving. Uh, but two things to flag here is firstly, we're talking about an error rate here on potentially very low concentration. So large number of compounds in a tire, very low concentration. So that needs to be borne in mind. But also the single biggest source of um, uncertainty was instrument drift. And the figure here is very much a worst case scenario. And this uh, already I mean, since, this, since this study has been significantly reduced. So actually the total uncertainty level uh, is already uh, significantly lower than that, those figures and improving all the time. So with our method, then we, we, I mean, we effectively take samples off the tires uh, and then they go into the, the 2D GC and, and then produce uh, chromatograms like this where the two main dimensions here are time and each compound is a uh, specific compound, the height is a proxy for the amount of that compound present. And as you can see, um, most obvious thing to include is there's a lot of compounds, organic compounds uh, in that, and that's a very typical single tire. Um, then I draw out, for purposes of illustration, uh, 10 different tires, randomly selected, and this chart here um, cross-references or analyzes those 10 tires by a range of prominent individual compounds uh, in those tires and uh, taking the peak error on the chromatogram as the sort of semi-quantitation, if you like. Um, and what we can see here is, I mean, first to note is, um, you know, the, well, we can see the, uh, the, also the description of what, what those compounds are at the bottom. So you've got a whole range of stuff. A lot actually here are fragrances uh, to make tires smell nice. Um, many of these here are irritants to humans, in the sense irritants to eyes or skin. Um, it's also notable that uh, they're all quite high order carbon compounds. So that really speaks to the need for the 2D GC to be able to separate these, which would not be readily possible with 1D GC. Um, other things to note is that there are two compounds here, um, uh, which are unknown. They're not in the standard libraries. Uh, so they're relatively prominent in tires, but essentially no one knows what they are. And that really speaks to what we're saying uh, up front is there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and more research needed as to uh, you know, the environmental effects of quite prominent compounds. The other really important point to illustrate here is, and this is just taking a sample of 10 tires, is that uh, tire number 10 stands out as a very different composition from the others. And that important point to take away from this is that tyres may all look like black circles but they're chemically really quite different from one another uh, and entire tire here is an illustration of just that. Now that is a measurement challenge uh, but it's equally a great opportunity because that'll mean undoubtedly that some are more and less toxic than others. So if the market can then be cajoled in the direction of the less toxic ones that's a really easy way of reducing the environmental impact of tyres. 
Out of these same 10 tires, there are two notable compounds I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, the first one, uh, phenyl 211 dimethyl ethyl 4 methyl, um, is particularly prominent in tire 8, and that is a respiratory irritant which has a leathery smell. So, one example of the sort of fragrances that are added, but that do have some health connotation. The other one, more famous one, is 6 PPD. Uh, which was particularly prevalent in tyre 4, but interestingly, to completely absent from tyre 5. So it was all of them but tyre 5, particularly in tyre 4, but not, not in tyre 5. Now this is the um, compound when reacting with ozone in the air leads to 6-PPD quinone, which has been linked to the very rapid uh, dying out of the coho salmon in California because of the way it, in, uh, it interferes with their reproductive system. Um, I'm not going to go into that, this in a lot more detail right now. There's published papers on it. It is an ongoing cause of concern. Um, but the, again, the message to take away here is that there is a tyre without it in it. It is not absolutely mandatory to have it in it. There are alternatives. Uh, it's a preservative in, in, in tyres. Um, with all that welter of chemical information then, I mean, to try and make sense of it, we can group them into fun what's called functional groups. So alkanes, cycloalkanes, terpenes and the like. And you can see here, you know, how you would carve up a chromatogram and group them and what in broad terms each group does. So, I mean, the least problematic here are generally the terpenes, which give aromas. The worst are the aromatics and the nitroaromatics, um, which are often uh, carcinogens. Uh, and so hold in mind these classifications as we move through uh, the results. So then we can take uh, the, uh, we've now tested then, uh, using this method, uh, over a hundred uh, different tires. Uh, and so I wanted to share with you then the results coming out of, of those. So if we, if we take uh, three groups, um, of, of these compounds. So acids, amines and alcohols is group one, alkanes, alkenes, alkynes is group two, and then aromatics and polycyclic aromatic and the, and the nitro aromatics in group three. Here we're showing the concentration of each of these compounds in each sample. And the code is, down the left is the code um, uh, that uh, indicates is the unique identifier of an individual tire. And then the averages, minimum, maxima, are the, across the whole set of 100. And what we know is that, you know, the, the, of all the compounds put in, some are deliberate additions, some are, you know, unknown come in components like carbon black that's put in. Um, but, they, but what we know is these generic groups have certain behaviours, whether they're irritants or carcinogens. And so using this sort of grouping is a good middle way of trying to synthesise all the information to doubt something we can get our heads around. Uh, and this table here, I picked the five with the, the top with the lowest amount in group three of the, the, the carcinogenic group, and also the highest five. Um, and what we can see is that if, as a proportion of the total, uh, uh, com uh, total compounds in each, that proportion of aromatics varies between 25% of the total at the low end and 80% of the total. So again, that uh, speaks to the compositions are very different and the compositions matter when it comes uh, to toxicity. So, so that's the chemical composition side. I want to now put that together with the wear rate. So how then to try and estimate how much of that stuff then gets into the environment. Well, so we've been conducting separately from the chemical on the road. We've been conducting real world wear rates uh, and it, it has two elements to it. It is a very simple mass loss. You know, weighing the tyres over a period of time, but also a real-time signal. First of all, let's look at the simple mass loss uh, calculation. So here we've tested tyres from 14 different brands, all from new, all driven then well over a thousand miles, um, and we're looking at the total mass loss from the four wheels added together, same vehicle, same route, same driver, and what we can see is the average mass loss is 73 milligrams per kilometre. Uh, we previously quoted 64, as our database has expanded that, that average has now drifted up slightly to 73. We still see when we do longer term tests that the rate declines approximately logarithmically 
as the tire ages to give an approximate lifetime mass loss of about 37 milligrams uh, per kilometer. So that's the rate at which, and you, and you can see the variability from the table between the different brands. So there is you know, a multiple factor difference between the fastest and the slowest wearing tires around that 73 average. What we can then do is take that wear rate and put it together with the speciation information to yield distance specific emissions for each individual compound. Now, and then sum them up into the functional groups as well. So that then washes out. So if we take that group three of the aromatics again, the average is releasing 8.1 milligrams per kilometer into the environment. Um, we can drill down to the individual components as well. So we could see in specific, we could see the amount of 6 PPD. Uh, I, I realize it's not in that group, but we could see 6 PPD um, per kilometer uh, released. So that really that is crucial stage in the method development to be able to, to, to see that level of real world distance specific emissions. Then moving on to the third part of the equation, if you remember back to the beginning is, and how toxic is all this stuff? So one way of doing it that we're, we're working with is using the um, GHS system. So the United Nations standardized system for uh, the globally harmonized system of classification of labeling of chemicals. And the table at the top right gives you a flavor of, and many of you will probably know these codes already, um, but uh, give you a flavor of this classification. Um, and we then put that together and use the US CAS system for the unique identification of the compounds, uh, and then take the disclosures on the European Chemical Agency database uh, for where the manufacturers disclose the present or these hazard codes against each of the, the chemicals in whatever their manufactured products are. Um, now these hazard codes, as you can see, describe a whole bunch of different effects from mild irritants to serious known carcinogens. Uh, and the list is a lot longer than this one. There's just a flavor at the top of it. And crucially, each compound can have multiple hazard codes. Uh, and also for the same compound, actually different manufacturers can make slightly different disclosures as well based on their research. But taking all that into account, we've developed a method then which synthesizes all that into a way of being able to ascribe a toxicity to each individual compound and then using the relative prevalence of the compound in a tire to do a weighted average up to a toxicity rating for the tire as a whole product. And this is obviously only one way of doing it, but this gives us a, a, a flag in the ground as to one way of doing it. Now, again, then apply that to the hundred odd tires we've already tested. So what do we see? Well, we see, first of all, that the average number of compounds in a tire, organic compound in a tire, we're seeing is 410 that we can separate. But only 78 of those, interestingly, can be automatically identified by the standard NIST library. So a significant three quarters of the compounds in the tire, we don't automatically know what they are. And that, again, comes, really emphasizes the degree of uncertainty we have. Um, across all the tires, there are 46 different unique hazard codes which have been cited. Um, the table on the uh, on the top right then takes, again, the five tires with the lowest toxicity rating weighted across all the compounds and the highest five to give you a flavor. And then there's the average. Now I've indexed this to 100 uh, for the average across the market uh, for easy comparison. Um, and what it shows is essentially the least toxic tire on this measure is, um, or the most toxic, I beg your pardon, is 6.7 times more toxic than the least toxic. So what we can see here then overall is that in terms of the chemical composition, tires are very different from one another. Uh, the wear rates are very different and the toxicities are very different. So there's a big, so the tires are very much a huge variation in the potential environmental impact of, of these products. And on that note, so considering then when, 
I mean, what is the actual environmental impact? We can see the potential for toxicity, but what's what's likely to be the um, vector for this getting into the um, environment? Well, one of the controversial areas has been, well, uh, how big are these particles? How big are the particles coming off the tire? I, mean, I think the uh, original view was that they were very large bits of rubber and didn't, you know, and, and fell straight to the ground and didn't really, you know, uh, get much further than that. Um, well, what we can see, so when we do our wear testing, we don't just wear the tires, well, weigh the tires. We also have a real time signal sampling from the device you can see top right. So that gives us a real time signal for the con mass concentration, which is the left hand chart over time, and number concentration, the right hand chart. And the different uh, colors you can see overlaid with the uh, very transient signal, that is the different size categories within those. Um, the message I want you to take away from this particular slide is firstly, this it's a very trans they're both very transient signals, so it's highly dependent on things like the driving style and road surface. Uh, but you've got both mass and number. This is, and you've got um, number including a lot of ultra fine particles. Uh, so it is not the case. It's clearly not the case that uh, tires just shed large chunks of rubber. If we look into that, then in a little bit more detail. Um, so we ran some tests uh, and this is normal driving on normal roads. This is not extreme driving, very average dynamic based on our Equa test, which is we developed for tailpipe emissions. And what we found was that um, of the fine particle mass, so below 2.5 microns in diameter, um, uh, sorry, 11 percent. 11% of the fine particle mass was below five um, microns in di diameter. And it's, it's really probably only these particles, the fine ones, that are likely to hang in the air for any period. The rest is likely to go pretty directly to either you know, soil and water via the drains and the verges of the road. But that 11% of the mass accounts for pretty much 100% of the particle number. And of that, those, the particle number, Ultrafines, below 23 nanometers, account for about 92% of the total number. So what you so what we've got is a very large number. And in this experiment, we're able to measure down to six nanometers. And you can see if on that measure, looking at the table at the right, we found 14.5 times 10 to the 11 per kilometer particles um, uh, that were emitted. Only 1.1 times 10 to the 11 per kilometer if you exclude the ultra fines. Nevertheless, even on that measure, a significant number of fine particles. In addition to all this, what we don't know is what the effect of VOCs dissorbed from the outside of the particles. This is all talking about the leaching of the chemicals from the particles themselves. But uh, what other VOCs might be sucked to the outside of those particles and be released into the air and contribute towards um, ozone or smog, uh, ground level ozone is uh, additional and unknown. But I think we can fairly conclude from this that tyres are simultaneously a problem for air, soil and water. Um, and uh, air is certainly not the dominant one of it, but all three uh, are, are, are vectors for this in all likelihood. So, and then finally, um, just looking in the wider context, um, well, firstly, it's in, you know, with all this talk of the environmental effects of tyres, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that tyres are there to do a job and they have all sorts of other properties. And those properties are reasonably well described by various tyre label systems that exist, in this case, I'm demonstrating Europe and US ones. Um, however, the focus is primarily on things like rolling resistance, grit, weather, noise, um, pollutant emissions are currently excluded. Uh, the closest proxy is the US Treadwear rating, which gives a, a rough proxy for the amount of material released into the environment. Um, in addition, obviously, price is an important metric in all this. This is a commercial business. Um, and so, uh, you know, the price of tyre uh, is, is an important uh, constituent for, for consumers. Um, 
but what I would say is all the work we've been done, been doing, and others are doing, um, could lead to a standard method to allow toxicity um, to be added to this tire label, and that would be a valid potential way forward to try and inform consumers and manufacturers uh, to be able to choose the tyres which are the less toxic. And that is one of the easiest routes to reducing the impact of tyres. Um, but even in the, in the short end, what we can do immediately is then to correlate the chemical composition with these performance criteria to see what the relationships are between the things going into the tyre and how they perform. And that may well point to R&D initiatives to reformulate tyres in such a way that is environmentally beneficial. I'd like to uh, wind up, or before winding up, I think it is really important just to circle back to the comment I made right early on uh, about comparing tyres to tailpipe. Um, and this is an area, of, I think it'd be fair to say, some controversy. Uh, the And certainly, the general belief or understanding of general public would is that tailpipe is the still the single biggest source of pollution from vehicle. Um, so there's a big um, inertia here in, in understanding. So I, I think to put it in real dramatic uh, contrast, uh, and uh, so this is to compare what we found out about the tire wear and compare it to a late, latest internal combustion engines. Not hybrids, um, but the very latest internal combustion engines you can buy today. So if we take the, the 37 milligrams per kilometer tire wear lifetime that we talked about earlier, that is itself eight times higher than the maximum permissible tailpipe mass emissions of 4.5 milligrams per kilometer. But the reality, because filtration on tailpipes is so good now, uh, the actual measured by us on the road is actually an astonishing 0 0.02 milligrams per kilometer of real world tailpipe mass. And so that actually, that ratio to tire wear emissions is almost 2000 times more tailpipe mass emissions than from a current vehicle. If you took vehicles of average age on the road, that would be a much lower ratio still the tyres would be higher, but it, this is a driven mathematically by how small that number is for internal combustion engines. If we look at particle number, our, our estimate of the 14.5 times 10 to the 11 per kilometre, um, including um, the ultra fines, um, that is 2.4 times the maximum permissible tailpipe of 6 times 10 to the 11. The real world is 0.9 times 10 to the 11 for gasoline and 0.1 times 10 to the 11 for diesel. Um, so if you average those two, tyres are 29 times higher uh, than the tailpipe. Um, then if we look at the um, weight dimension, um, we found that the tyre emissions increase by 21% for extra, every extra half tonne of vehicle weight everything else being equal. Now I put that, so that in itself is um, important. Um, and this is not a pop at BEVs uh, and it is all else equal. So we're not including the um, regenerative braking capability, um, but that 21% increase, um, that increase itself is 380 times the average actual total tailpipe emissions uh, mass emissions. So that just gives you an idea, even just that increment from adding a battery weight size uh, weight to a vehicle is many, many, many times the total amount coming out of the tailpipe emissions. So however you look at it, whichever metric you use, um, there is strong evidence that the tire wear emissions now are by far the dominant, uh, dominant over tailpipe emissions. So it is not something we can brush under the carpet any longer. So in summary, uh, that's why we believe that you know, tire wear emissions are a material and growing concern for air, soil and water and all the potential indirect effects, including into the human food chain. But what we're showing is that, you know, this is still work in progress, but the wear can be measured in real world conditions. 
2D gas chromatography offers the possibility of full chemical profiling of these tyres. I haven't talked about metals, uh, but we've also done work with NPL around um, ICPMS to look at the metals component as well. Um, toxicity can be estimated from, from that information, and we can then start linking the composition to the performance and all the valuable um, utility in terms of safety and performance that tyres uh, deliver. And we will now, all this data I've talked about and much more will be going into our subscription database, which we're launching middle of next month, our fingerprinting database, um, which is designed for benchmarking and research and development and any other purpose of you know, uh, allowing this information to be used to deliver better, cleaner, cleaner tyres. So on that note, thank you very much indeed for listening. I've run a little bit over. We still got about 20 minutes uh, for questions. So I'm just going to pause for a second and uh, uh, look at your questions and then um, I will dive into them. But please do keep um, keep submitting them in, in the chat box. So uh, thank you very much and uh, give me uh, 10 seconds and I will uh, start addressing. Thank you very much. Okay, so tackling the first question. Um, so, uh, which organization has assessed the 300,000 tons of tyre rubber released annually? Um, so, well, that's our estimate. Uh, so, it's based upon uh, research into the number of vehicles on the road, uh, the uh, miles driven, um, this was US and Europe, um, and then putting it together with the wear rates uh, that we have measured, which I presented today, uh, and that, that adds up. Uh, to that, that value. Uh, question, is there a reference list available in terms of toxicity of tyres? Um, well, I'm, I'm not, a, beyond what I presented today, I'm not aware of that. What we're trying to do is fill in that knowledge gap. Um, what, where there are external references is you can, it's publicly available information in terms of what the hazard codes are. Uh, what the manufacturer's disclosures are on the European Chemical Agency's website. Um, so we are harnessing that publicly available information and putting it together with our proprietary chemical composition information to deliver that toxicity rating. Um, and as part of database subscriptions, uh, our the methodology, the precise methodology we use to derive the toxicity uh, ratings um, would, be, would, be, would be given to the subscribers. Uh, next question, does inflation pressure influence tyre emissions? Are all the te test is, tests conducted at manufacturers recommended pressures? Uh, well, in this case of what I presented, uh, yes, all the tyres every time are at the same and the manufacturers recommended pressures um, for purposes of standardisation and comparison. Um, that's not to say that inflation pressures do, to our understanding, do affect um, tyre emissions. Um, certainly under inflation can lead to incre significantly increased emissions, uh, although that's not a dimension yet we've tested in any sort of any detail. Um, are you saying that these fragrance compounds are actually added to the tyres deliberately? Well, I, I guess the, the straightforward is, I don't know. We don't know for certain. Um, and uh, it and whether those are, and there's a useful comment uh, in the chat, you may be able to see from David Shaw, um, in terms of saying that um, uh, they may not be added deliberately come as a result of reactions and interactions of the curing temperatures. Um, that may well, I'm sh sure that is true, um, but nevertheless, uh, untreated tyres can smell bad in my understanding. And so there is um, definitely a motivation potentially to add um, fragrances, um, but what combination of those are uh, um, a, a result of existing processes or deliberate additions, I, I don't know at this stage. Um, someone's asked if it's possible to have the slides after the talk um, and pass them on. Absolutely. Um, uh, please consider this is um, in the public domain now, um, and I'd be very happy to supply PowerPoint. Uh, and also there will be a rerun of this at five o'clock BST today, and recordings will also be available for anyone who uh, has missed it.
So then, yes, so we've got, can we explain our sampling uh, method? Um, so, yes, yeah, so from every tyre, we, well, there's actually two. Today I presented the results of where we're taking the material uh, from the new tyre. So actually a physical sample from the tyre, brand new. Um, the other method that we use is to actually capture real world wear particles. Uh, and that sampling device I showed on one of the slides is also used for that purpose. So we can, so, we, so there's two sources of the tire material. The main time we use the latter method is when then we want to do toxico toxicological experiments on that actual tire wear and expose that to human lung cells and the like. Um, for this fingerprinting database, we're taking it from the, the tire itself and we take multiple samples from that tire. Now we take, uh, and often we're uh, taking the vents views and we, because the material is, is homogeneous and they're easy to take. Uh, however, because about 10% of the tires in the market we understand may have different compounds on the outside edge of the tire from the inside edge, we take samples from both parts of the tire and so we can pick up any differences between the two. So we, we, are, we are taking multiple um, uh, samples from each and then when we go to and then when we for example studied the uncertainty there were you know, multiple repeated samples and looking looking at the repeatability for, for exactly the, the point you, you're raising about robustness and repeatability. Um, so the lifetime uh, so what, what's the lifetime of of the tires now that's a uh, 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 that's a good question, an interesting question, and uh, we, uh, and obviously the wear rate of the tire influences the lifetime of it. Um, uh, we're typically using something around fifteen or uh, fifteen thousand miles uh, lifetime on tires, but it's a very good point. That thirty-seven estimate, thirty-seven milligrams per kilometer estimation, does have uh, fair uncertainty around it due to knowing what the actual lifetime is. What we're very confident in is the 73 um, because all the tyres last, you know, th th that's a valid number up to about 5,000 miles uh, age of the tyre and because all tyres make it to that length then that, that is a much more robust uh, figure to use. Uh, question, if the wear rate improves over the life of the tyre, does that mean that other performance properties worsen over the life of the tyre and does that mean that the label tyre performance is not representative over the tyre's lifetime performance? Well that's um, yeah that's absolutely um, potentially true um, and some but some of the properties actually will in, will improve uh, over the, the life of the tyre so as the tread wears down the rolling resistance will typically fall and so the uh, fuel economy will improve, the CO2 will reduce that's why that often when vehicles are certified, they will be run with part worn tires uh, on them. So as the tire ages, uh, it is, uh, there's a complex trend in terms of, and trade-offs between the different performances that does happen. For the purposes of this, uh, and why we take it from the tire absolutely as brand new, is to, uh, to avoid, you know, from building this fingerprinting database point of view, any artifacts about vehicle aging, uh, sorry, tire aging, or indeed degradation of those tires during storage in the supply chain. Uh, question, is the toxicity correlated to manufacturing companies and where they were made, Europe versus US versus Asia? Really good question. Well, I mean, that will, that's an explicit segmentation of the data that will be available in our database. Um, also, we will be segmenting by budget, mid-market, premium tyres uh, as well. Um, what I can say uh, as a high level comment is that uh, it seems to be that at the high end of the market, which is typically dominated by manufacturers from certain regions, um, there does seem to be a lot of innovation in the compounds. And so where we see quite significant differences in the chemical makeup and toxicity is at the high end of the market. And, but in the mid to lower end of the market, there's much less differentiation between the tires, which 
while we don't know, would point to there's a lot of intellectual property held by the more premium manufacturers that goes to the chemical composition and potentially to the benefit of, of, of health and the environment. Um, but maybe the more mass market part is more undifferentiated in its chemical composition. Uh, so, but the database will lay clear um, what those differences are, those segmentations are, so you can um, research um, uh, extensively. So, uh, talking about the test method and how um, and using how we make sure that the accelerated test method um, leads to the right conclusion about the compounds that we're detecting. Um, uh, and the uh, imp implication is not an artifact of the method. Um, the method is something that we have spent a very significant amount of time uh, developing and uh, comparing to other methods as well uh, to minimize the potential artifacts of the method. And what we're trying to get to is something which best simulates the real world without creating those artifacts. And so through the method of validation we've gone through, we're very happy with that. Uh, I mean, it would be something I'd be more than happy to talk about more offline uh, and also subscribers to the database would then get a lot more knowledge about the nature of, uh, of the method. Um, I think it's better, I mean, no method would claim to be perfect in this regard. It's about choosing one that is the most realistic and has the fewest artifacts. Um, question, how do we make sure that what we detect behind the tyre is coming from the tyre and not resuspension? Very good question. Um, well, the fir first thing what we know is that by the weighing of tyres, we can uh, be clear on you know, how much of it is actually mass shed from the tyre. Um, so we can, we've always got that um, calibration, if you like. But it is true. It is true that our device for sampling will pick up some brake wear and some resuspension. It is mounted in such a way as to minimize that amount. Uh, and so we believe it is small. However, uh, it is still required to, after the fact, um, try and extract out uh, uh, the proportion that is due to uh, uh, is due to other sources. And we do that, and that's where the fingerprinting database comes in helpful again, which is we know what's in tires. And so where we see compounds that are not present in tires, we can then use that as the basis of correcting the figures we measure to at least back out an estimated amount for resuspension and, and brake wear. Um, I mean, again, this the system needs further refinement, but it, certainly this fingerprinting database holds out the possibility of being able to take essentially any sample from the air or water and being able to do a source apportionment by knowing in detail what is in the tyres as source. Okay. Uh, have you done any in vitro toxicology to confirm your tox uh, toxicity score? Um, otherwise, it's an estimation of risk and not a true toxicity score. I think that's an absolutely fair comment, and I, I mean, I'm not going to over. I mean, I've set out the method and the rationale for doing it. What we are doing in parallel, though, with Imperial College is looking at, and doing exactly these uh, toxicological experiments by exposing tire particles to uh, human lung cells um, in the laboratory and studying the reaction. Uh, so, and that's, you know, there are many experiments, again, that could be done. This is going to be research of many years by many people. Um, but as a start, you know, we're not just taking our estimated toxicology and taking and saying that's the universal answer, but now then pushing forward the research and trying to um, uh, understand then the true effects. Um, so a lot of work to do. And I, if, uh, I'm very keen to hear from anyone who's got expertise in this to help push this forward. Uh, how do we compare EVs uh, to um, ICE vehicles to evaluate the effect of high instant torque of EVs? Um, so this is a, uh, quite, I <laughs> put it uh, diplomatically, the area of some ongoing research, because I was very careful on my slide to uh, say 
21% extra tire emissions for 500 kilos of weight, all else being equal. And obviously all else is not equal. And the, in the data I'm seeing from third party sources with battery electric vehicles is that the tire wear emissions uh, are highly variable. So some people are getting much lower tire wear, other people are getting much higher tire wear. The best hypothesis we have for that is it's how people drive. So to what degree people are availing themselves of the joy of the extra torque. And those who drive much more aggressively, obviously will eat through tires, but if you're an eco driver, equally you can get the opposite. So whereas ICE has fairly predictable tire wear emissions, we're finding BEVs have very unpredictable and it's likely to be the driving style, although you know our research is ongoing and I haven't got a definitive position on that. And I always believe in, you know, let the, the, the data must speak, but that's how it seems to be going at the moment. Uh, okay, um, getting uh, lo take the last few questions and so we can wrap up at, at, uh, on the hour. Um, uh, are the worst performing tyres in relation to harmful emissions the cheaper budget tyres? In, in wear rate, it's not necessarily the case. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between the wear rate and the price of the tyre. What there does seem to be is a difference in the chemical composition and toxicity where cheaper tyres are more toxic. Uh, and I, I keep that as a very broad comment at this stage, and there is definitely still more analysis to do, but uh, it does seem to be that the premium tyres seem to win more on the chemical composition than they do on the wear rate. Um, will we be publishing the res these results? Um, well, I mean, as I said, this slide deck is, uh, as far as I can say, and you're very welcome to use any content in it. To get more data, that's where our subscription database comes in. And uh, and so you know, anyone who's interested in subscribing, please do get in contact. We will be releasing certain portions of it for strictly academic research. So um, university researchers and the like, uh, again, please do get in contact. Um, but we're, we're keen to have uh, as many people working with this data and helping us improve this uh, as possible. Could the problems with tire abrasion um, be solved if the materials were non-hazardous? Um, I guess it depends on what we mean by non-hazardous. Um, if, if the chemicals themselves were less toxic, um, according to the hazard codes, that would undoubtedly be an improvement. Whether particles, even if they're not made of these toxic chemicals, still have some deleterious effect when inhaled or swallowed, uh, I think they still do, but probably would be potentially significantly, significantly less. But um, I have to say and that is, uh, I can't, Give a definitive position on that uh, due to lack of research so far. Okay, I think I'll just take one more. Um, um, just for clarity, the presentation this evening at five o'clock is a rerun of this. Um, with I'll take live questions again for anyone who missed it, but it will be a rerun of this presentation. Um, Uh, last question then, just thinking about the range of comments, would you find more such compounds, more exotic compounds, where the percentage of natural rubber is higher? Um, so I think what we're finding is that they're very different. Um, and uh, yes, there are there are some con uh, uh, compounds there that are not there um, uh, in, in the synthetic rubber, but it does seem to be the number of compounds is much higher uh, with the synthetic rubber tires for light duty vehicles and um, and that wider number of compounds encapsulates everything from the good to the bad so there's some so this i guess there's more control potentially in the synthetic um but there's also more and a wider range of uh, pro problematic compounds even though a lot of them are are not toxic themselves uh right so i think there's there's a few more questions and um, which i have not got time to uh, cover. Um, uh, I'm very happy. Please do get in touch with me if, if, uh, if there are any remaining questions you don't feel I've answered um, or, or join this afternoon at five o'clock British summer time. Um, but uh, I, please do. My email is, is up there. Please do get in contact. Um, uh, really appreciate everyone's input and your time today. Hope you found this interesting and uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, they are selected. We are we are trying to get as broad a possible coverage of the market. So we have 
selected it from a wide variety of brands. Um, around 40 different brands are already represented in our samples. Uh, and uh, from a whole range of uh, geographical origins, so European manufacturers, American, Asian, uh, at range of price points from the most budget up to the most premium. So by and large at the moment, we are just trying to get the best possible coverage in the early days. Um, there is, that said, a interest in innovative formulations. So although it's not included in the 100 I've shown today, uh, we are testing the uh, Continental Dandelion tyre, um, which is um, on the market in certain forms already. Uh, so we will also focus in on ones which may not yet be high selling, but are innovative uh, and interesting. The, all the tyres we've shown today are light duty tyres, um, so cars and vans. We are also testing uh, heavy duty tyres as well and looking at the, you know, the effect of the differential effects of higher natural rubber proportions in the heavy duty tyres. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, but our aim as an ongoing test program, and, and that actually I didn't bring out in the presentation. This is not a one-off study. The database we're talking about is going to be an ongoing flow of testing to be able to track over time the changes, improvements in the formulations. And so we're expecting to do many hundreds of tests per year uh, to make that a reality. Um, do you expect different tyre emissions performance in cold and hot weather conditions? Um, I would say, uh, yes, we would, but we are not at the moment, at least testing for that specifically. Uh, clearly in hotter climates, we would expect to see the uh, aging process to be faster, the leaching of the, co uh, the compounds faster, uh, but uh, I don't want to uh, overclaim in terms of what we know uh, at this stage. What type of toxicity uh, uh, tests were performed? Uh, well, I, so, I mean, there's two elements to it. What I showed primarily in, in terms of the quantification was using the, uh, the, the hazard codes from the manufacturer's statements that are publicly available on the chemical agency's website. But there is, which I haven't shown, we are also doing um, uh, you know, tests in terms of uh, exposing uh, the tyre wear emissions to human lung cells and other toxicological tests uh, together with various academic partners to try and understand, you know, beyond those statements of toxicity, um, can we validate them and deepen that understanding through scientific experiments? Now, that is not the core business of emissions analytics, and that's why we partner up with others and universities, um, but we are trying to do everything we can to un understand that uh, the real world toxic effects. And, and we are conscious as well, that there are many compounds here which sound awful, sound and, and come with all sorts of labels of toxicity, but actually in practice, in the concentrations observed, um, we do need to always ask the question of whether they are in fact so damaging and toxic at those concentrations. So we, we will always be testing the conclusions to the best we can and want to collaborate with anyone who has intelligence information uh, to, to, to deepen the understanding. Uh, next question, how do your toxicity results compare to the toxicity of tailpipe emissions? Uh, and how surprising do you think the results would be to regulators? Well, now this is a, a very interesting question because we are using very similar approaches and the two dimensional GC uh, to uh, measure tailpipe emissions and, and do an equivalent speciation. Now, to allow that to happen, we have developed a, uh, a proprietary device, which actually is now patent pending, to be able to take sample of the hot exhaust uh, via a uh, dilution system onto a range of sampling tubes. So, uh, uh, so 10 ax tubes, um, to capture, particularly to capture the various um, uh, VOCs. Uh, and then we use the, uh, we dissolve those into the system using the Marx International um, 
auto sampler and desorbing system. And so we can get a, obviously a detailed separation, but there is one other element to the system, which is interesting, which is that we couple that with a geofencing system, which automatically flips between different tubes, depending on what type of road the vehicle is running on. So we actually get different tubes for urban, rural and motorway driving. So not only can we do the detailed speciation and the toxicity calculations overall, we can actually break it out by different modes of driving. Uh, and potentially we can configure that so it could be uphill versus downhill driving or heavy acceleration and the like. So we're able to do that, that breakout and give a, it's not a real time signal, but it's a sort of pseudo dynamic signal um, without losing the speciation. Now, so, but what we're seeing uh, in terms of relative to tyres is the volume of these uh, VOCs and SVOCs at the tailpipe is in total in total mass much lower uh, than we're seeing at tyres. But obviously that's emitted in much shorter intense bursts and often directly in, uh, in it, into the air in urban locations. Whereas tyres, it it's often maybe larger or, or via soil and water and the leaching out over time and into the food chain uh, that, that we're seeing the vector there. So we're seeing very much, you know, often a lot of the same sorts of compounds, but the, the mechanism they will uh, get into the environment and ultimately have effects on humans and animals is quite different. And we don't pretend to have the whole end to end piece yet. Um, but uh, we are we are doing both at the same time. Um, but there's nothing that I've seen that brings takes me away from the conclusion that in, tailpipe emissions are on the decline in terms of, of interest and importance, and, and tyres is on the increase. Um, moving on, um, uh, so how well are the uh, leaching mechanisms understood and are we being exposed to these organics as gases as well as airborne particulates um, and how much do we understand about the toxicity of, of the compounds within particulates um, so yeah that's that's a big question an important question and, it, and I touched on it briefly in that it isn't just about the particles themselves and what leaches out of them over time um, it is uh, about what uh, VOCs may be stuck to the outside of them um, and, uh, and, and what may off gas either uh, uh, from those particles or indeed off gas directly from the tyres themselves as they are on the vehicles. So this presentation is focused on the partic particles element, but there's definitely a, a VOCs off gassing element as well, where we and they're, you know, but airborne and get inhaled, but also airborne and then react with other gases in the atmosphere to either produce ground level ozone or secondary organic aerosol particles as well, which then will have further complex uh, effects down the chain. So there's a lot still to be understood, but um, what's fascinating about this is those multiple channels um, of environmental impact. What about wheel alignment and four wheel drive? Um, so wheel alignment, well, although this is something really others have studied rather than us, we can we, we can see a slight misalignments of, of wheels can lead to significantly increased um, uh, particle wear, but also the size distribution can also be dramatically different as well. Four wheel drive really speaks to the wider question of, of torque delivery uh, of the vehicle to the road uh, and whether actually four-wheel drive can potentially be less emitting um, uh, than, than two-wheel drive but it is crucially dependent on people how people naturally drive. Which policies are uh, additionally necessary to lower the risk of toxic pollutants of tyre wear entering the environment? Well actually the, the natural way to think about it is to regulate tyre wear rates whether it's the mass or the number or the some species, but it may prove because of the compl complexities of measurement, it may prove easier and more effective to regulate compounds into the tire that's allowed in the manufacture. 
And this to some extent happens already under REACH, I believe it's eight compounds um, that are already regulated. So there's a, a limit value on what can go in in terms of composition. That in simple terms could be significantly widened, um, the limits lowered uh, potentially. So that may actually be a, a better way of doing it. And why I lean that way as well is that there will always be um, a, a quite a significant wear rate in all likelihood um, to be able to deliver the safety and other performance requirements uh, that, that, are, that are on tyres. Uh, and so there may be, we can only limit it to a certain degree by re reducing the wear rates uh, and, and therefore tackling it in terms of what's allowed to go in in the first place may prove to be the better way of doing it. Okay, uh, la wrapping up with the last few questions then. Um, have you tested the same tyre multiple times uh, and the same tyre brand from different lots and years? Um, so yes, we, we've definitely tested the same tyre multiple times and that's been part of, for example, the work with National Physical Laboratory and looking at the uncertainty. Uh, so we've, we've done repeatability studies you know, using same tyre. We are now in the process of you know, doing a number of things. One is we, we have actually got the um, same tyre from different sources, which may have been stored in warehouses for different lengths of time, and that will feature in our database. But we are also taking the same tyre that we've tested already and then aging it ourselves just by having it sit there for a period, and then we'll retest it over time. So we're looking at that, that you know, the aging process, the repeatability in a number of, of different dimensions uh, to see. I, I, have, I have to say, we don't have strong hypotheses as to what it'll tell us, um, but it's important work um, to do. Um, are there any significant differences in summer and winter tyres? Um, uh, that is, uh, well, a key thing which will be in the database. And I mean, I think the, the answer is yes, absolutely. To draw any broad brush stroke answers, it, it's difficult to say, but I would you know, encourage, it will be something that our, that our database will seek to tackle. Um, uh, there is, of course, you know, big, uh, and that's what I'm thinking of chemical composition, there's definitely wear rate differences and speak to any Scandinavian country and the, the studded tires, winter tires do abrade much, much faster. But generally with uh, size distribution, size distribution skew towards the larger particles. Um, is the tyre chemical composition uniform across its depth or does its composition change as it wears? Um, well, so far we have found that it's, the chemical composition is uniform as it wears, or, um, even though the wear rate will decline over time. Um, but do note that uh, the for about 10% of the tyres on the market, the inside and the outside of the tyres have different compositions. So that, that is a difference. Um, but we are testing it as well over time to see, do we get to a point you know, on the tread as it wears down, does the chemical composition change? But we haven't found anything uh, as yet. Um, will the database include the brand and manufacturer information for each tyre? Absolutely. So it will have as full disclosure as we possibly can about you know, and also the dimensions of the tire, uh, the year of it, uh, it'll link to the tire label, so it'll give as full as possible metadata on that tire as possible. I mean, after all, we have just bought these tires from the market, we are not constrained in what we can say, so there'll be the most disclosure we possibly can do. Um, and there will be the option um, if there are specific tires, despite the hundreds that will be in the database that we haven't tested. Um, if there's any specific ones you want see, seen tested, um, then, then we will seek them out and add those to the database. Absolutely. Um, uh, does the weight of vehicle make a difference to the emissions you measure? Um, uh, well, we, we've, only, we've only tested it so far in passenger cars and then putting extra load. We haven't done it on HGVs, but where we've done it on the car, that's where we've derived that 21% increase in the mass loss for a, for a 500 kilogram payload, um, which was 
yes, it simulates payload and passengers, but it also is roughly equivalent to a large battery of a battery electric vehicle. As to what that increment will be on HGVs, I wouldn't say we can make an easy read across. Um, so it'll almost certainly increase, uh, but we'll have to do that experiment um, to, to find out. Um, is there a final question? Uh, is there a way to physically remove the tyre air emissions? Uh, e.g. by a suction filter, or is that unrealistic? Well, there's a company in the UK called the Tyre Collective, um, which came out of uh, Imperial College, which is trying to do exactly that by using units fixed behind the tyre and uh, electrostatic system to attract those particles in, uh, which uh, seems to be delivering some uh, promising results uh, so far. Uh, I, I think they, it's not yet fully brought to market, and uh, I think getting integration, OEM integration into the vehicles um, would be a breakthrough moment for that system. But I think it is, it is, um, and I'll defer to the Tire Collective to speak, but uh, it seems to be able to suck up quite a significant proportion of the tyre particles on the test rigs uh, that they're, they're seeing. Um, so that is a possibility. Um, and uh, I think some combination of that and of reformulating the tyres and limiting certain uh, particularly noxious chemicals that go in could be a really very effective way overall to to mitigate these these tire emissions. So I think on that note, I'm one minute over time. Um, so I'm going to draw a, a close there. If there's any questions I haven't managed to ask, or if you have any supplementaries interested in our database, my contact details are there. Be delighted to to discuss. And um, and I think that, you know. We're very committed to this. This is an ongoing uh, investment uh, and, and work we're doing to get to the bottom of this. So uh, on that note, really appreciate every, everyone is busy. Appreciate your time and attention and for all your questions uh, and uh, look forward to speaking more again soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye.